Hello all sentient beings and welcome to Transmissions Alt Mode where we talk about all news, comics, and media related to the... On this episode of Transmissions Alt Mode, we review Transformers 84, Secrets and Lies number 1. Transformers War for Cybertron Siege has a new trailer on the way, and we have a whole lot of convention news updates for you. Today is Friday, July 17th, 2020, and this is episode 190 of Transmissions Alt Mode. Welcome to Transmissions Alt Mode, the podcast that continues to set records day after day for infecting the fandom with joy. I'm your host, Charles, a.k.a. Big C, and I'm joined by the excellent Transmissions team, Jeremy, a.k.a. Yakko. Hey, how's it going? The amazing Epic. Hello. And Daryl, the Cybertronian Beast. <laughs> so much joy. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk Transformers. You're in Canada. We ke- we keep all the joy down here in the States. <laughs> you, guys you don't have, have any joy. You guys have a lot of joy down there. You have so much joy. <laughs> <laughs> all right. As always, we start off the show by thanking our Donatrions, those lovely people who give us money on Patreon and PayPal. We really appreciate your support and thank you immensely for continuing to show us your love. If you would like to become a Donatrion, just go to transmissionspodcast.com slash support and that's where you can sign up on Patreon or PayPal. You can also help us out by buying merchandise from our Tee Public store that is at transmissionspodcast.com slash shop. And we've got lots of cool designs, shirt, t-shirt designs and masks. You can also check out our artist friend, K-Girl, at her store at tpublic.com slash user slash superstar K. We've also got uh, the next episode of Empire of Rust, episode 28, the explosion episode. This will be out this coming Monday, July 20th. And that will be in the main transmissions feed or at transmissions.com's trans transmissionspodcast.com slash rust so check out uh, what's going on with the live action transformers rpg podcast and we've got another uh just another quick announcement a little tease uh, with the war for cybertron netflix show coming out very soon in about two weeks we've got a special interview with the showrunner fj DeSanto. And that will be out the week that the episode, uh, the Netflix show drops. So the week of July 30th, it should be out just a couple days before July 27th. It's a spoiler free interview, so don't worry about any spoilers. And then we will also be dropping our review of the show. Uh, we'll do a spoiler free review and then maybe we'll do a spoiler discussion later on. Uh, so stay tuned for those things uh, just a couple weeks away and the Netflix show is coming. So let's start off and talk about some comics news. So we've just got one item in uh, comics news this week. We've got some line art from artist Blackie Shepard, who is doing some of the interiors for Transformers number 21. And uh, so this is, I think, uh, Blackie Shepard and it's and... uh, Billy Montfort. So these two artists are doing, I guess they're, they're doing joint art duties on this issue of Transformers. This should be out maybe next week. Uh, And so I'm curious to see uh, how these, how these guys uh, interpret Transformers. Cause these are, I think, I, I think they've done covers before, or at least Blackie Shepard, I think has done a Transformers cover before, but he did a recent cover like last issue, I think. Okay. But yeah, I'm just looking at the line art for uh, his interiors, and it looks pretty good. So uh, I'm curious mm-hmm. to see uh, how the issue turns out. All the characters really look really clean. well done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really clean line art. Yeah, it looks really nice. Although I'm confused about a couple of things, but we'll talk about it when the issue comes out, I think. All right, so uh, that's all the comics news. So let's move on to our comic review. For our comic review this week, we are finally looking at Transformers 84 Secrets and Lies number one. This was written by Simon Furman. Art is by Guido Guidi. Colors by John Paul Bovet. Letters by Jake M. Wood. 
editors are David Marriott and Tom Waltz, and assistant editor is Riley Farmer. Uh, we have 10 covers. We're not going to go into all 10 covers. Uh, many are retailer exclusives. Um, we have some links in the show notes but um, where you can get some of those. But the, the main four covers you can get are um, cover A, which has a Starscream uh, with a smoking blaster at, with a, a seemingly dead Skyfire in the foreground. And, and that, that cover is art by Guido Guidi. Cover B has um, Shockwave, Ratbat, and Skyfire looking over uh, as the Ark and the Nemesis blast off from Cybertron. This is art by Casey Holler and colors by John Paul Bovet. Retailer Incentive A has um, Optimus and Megatron uh, facing, I guess, back to back. And as the Ark blasts off and then we see in shadow uh, Counterpunch. Might be Punch. I'm not sure. He, it's just a shadow. Uh, this is art by Nick Roach, colors by Josh Burcham. And Retailer Incentive B has the Dinobots charging forward. This is by Jeff Sr., colors by Josh Burcham. And then, like I said, there were six other covers. Um, just br- briefly, there are um, matching covers that have um, Optimus uh, facing off with uh, Soundwave. Both of them look like they've been in a fight. Oddly, Optimus is holding Megatron in gun mode. This was this one you had. Uh, Stuart Sager is the artist on both of those. Uh, and then we have a more modern look of Optimus and Megatron. That is John Jiang. And then there there is a convention variant uh, that is essentially it's the 86 box art of Optimus Prime. And I imagine that will be available on the IDW website probably around the, the San Diego convention time, uh, late July, I guess in a week or so. So, uh, Epic, I'll start with you. Uh, which one of these mini covers do you like? I like the RIA cover, the Optimus and Megatron back-to-back with the Ark and Counterpunch. I like just how clean it is. Uh, I mean, the Dinobots one's also pretty clean, but it's just, I like how it sums it. I feel like it sums up what's, like, the main characters and stuff going on in it, and I just think it's really cool. I really like this one. Charles, I'm guessing you like the Jeff Senior cover? I do, but I'm actually going to pick uh, the, the Guido Guidi cover as my favorite. I just I just think it really matches the aesthetic of the book, even though it's kind of lying about what's in the book, because this, this never actually happens. <laughs> but, but I really like this image. I yeah. think Guido Guidi has mastered the retro look for the, the Transformers 84 series. I mean, he already was doing... This he, I mean he he was refining it and refining it for generation uh, uh, regeneration one. I, I think he's perfected it here. I really like uh, the art that he's been doing on these books. Cool. Well, you you surprised me because usually if it's Jeff Senior anything, that's what you like. <laughs> no, yeah, that that's true. And and I I I, I think all these covers, all the like the main four covers are really great. The Casey Collar. And John Paul Bove one, the Nick Roche one, and the um, uh, and the uh, Jeff Senior one. Yeah, who who colored the did Josh Burcham color both the Nick Roche and the Jeff Senior ones? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah. So. They they all I, they, I think they all did a great job. I would uh, if my comic shop was still getting variant covers, I might pick all of these up. But unfortunately, I only I only get cover A these days. All right. Well, Daryl, how about you? Well, I mean, these four covers, they're all really, really good. Um, I usually would pick Guido's cover of, because I really, really like his work, but I can't pick it on the basis of why Charles mentioned how it's kind of lying. So I really like it. If I end up having to buy this cover because it's the only one left, then I'll be happy with it. It's It's really an awesome cover. I'm not a huge fan of the coloring on cover B. It's, I mean, I know what he's doing. I know what John Paul is doing is the retro Yom Tov style. So, I mean, I, I, I'm not mad at John Paul. It's just, it doesn't work for me. The RIB is awesome. The Jeff senior cover with the Dinobots, but the Autobot symbols are stamps. And that's something that always bothers me. They're just, they're too perfect. 
And, you know, it just when you're trying to do something that's this style and everything's kind of rough and, you know, kind of gritty. And then you've got these pristine Autobot logos that are just kind of they stand out like a sore thumb. And it especially on Grimlock, where it's like in shadow and then you have this exactly. Yeah, just, clear yep, yep. yeah. So I'm like, just leave them off. Completely. Yeah, it's just it doesn't work. And, I, you know, I get that they're not easy symbols to draw. But, I mean, Jeff Sr. has been drawing this stuff for decades. Like, he's probably knows how to draw these symbols. The Nick Roach one, I got to go with it because of, I mean, the same reasons that Epic mentioned. It's just awesome. It's it's really well positioned. The, uh, the layout is really awesome. Um, Optimus and Megatron just, you know, back to back is just, it looks awesome. And uh, it really does, it just looks good with, uh, with I'm assuming it is punch counter punch in the in the foreground there in the shadow yeah i just i like the way it looks and uh i hope to be able to pick it up i'm gonna have to see if i can pull some strings and uh and pick it up all right well i i think i'm gonna go with the cover b uh, i like casey's look on these and i actually enjoy you know the yamtov dots and stuff i i i'm a sucker for that old design and you know i, I just I love, I love Casey's clean looks on these characters. It's just, it's always great. Mm-hmm. All right, uh, into the story itself. Counterpunch, deep in deep cover inside the Decepticons has more stories to tell. He comes into Shockwave's lab where uh, Shockwave, Starscream, and Skyfire are working on Project Dreadnought. Unfortunately, all the fuel is now being diverted to the war, so the project is having some issues getting to completion. Uh, This project is to enable some giant turbines that are on the surface of Cybertron to make the planet mobile and make it into a war world. Counterpunch tells Shockwave that Megatron wants him. Megatron is discussing upcoming battle plans and Ratbat is complaining about how overcommitted they are for fuel, but Megatron doesn't want to hear it and he sends Ratbat away. Suddenly there's an explosion uh, on the planet that has altered the planet's trajectory. Skyfire notes that it's now heading into an asteroid field and Shockwave wants to use Project Dreadnought to move the planet out of the way. However, Megatron wants to wait and see what the Autobots do. Flying back to his lab, Ratbat is waiting on Shockwave. He knows that Shockwave was behind the explosion, but he can't prove it yet. Later, Megatron is preparing the um, Nemesis for launch. It launches in one day, but Shockwave tells Skyfire that he's staying behind to finish it, despite him being the one that basically designed the ship. While this is happening, Punch is meeting with Prowl to give him all the information about Project Dreadnought, and Prowl decides that decides to work on it without telling Optimus. As Optimus is too busy with the Ark right now. Uh, Prowl asks Perceptor to investigate and says that he'll need their old demolition team. So Perceptor and the Dinobots head to where the explosion was to investigate. During this investigation, they're detected by Shockwave, and he and Skyfire go to take care of them. While they're, invest- or while they're going after the Autobots, uh, Megatron is wondering where Shockwave is and sends the Coneheads to go find him. Skyfire uh, has located the Dinobots and attacks, but ultimately he gets cut down when the Dinobots distract him and Grimlock comes out of hiding and clips his wing. However, Shockwave has reached them and blasts all of the Dinobots, deactivating them. Perceptor had been hiding, and he watches as Shockwave takes Skyfire's brain module in hopes of creating a new body. As he leaves, the Coneheads show up and take him back to Megatron. Later, the Autobots have come to rescue Perceptor and the Dinobots as the Arkham Nemesis, at the end of the book, blasts off. That is the end of the the book. Um, I feel like this was a very, very strong start. It, very Decepticon heavy, but I love seeing Counterpunch, you know, being the double agent and stuff. I, lots of intrigue. The The fight at the end was a lot of fun. It just, it, this is really kind of just setting the scene, I think, for what's what's to come. Reminding people of, of t- certain character traits like uh, Ratbat being a fuel auditor in the G1 series. I, I love that it's like Skyfire here, whereas in the, the G1 series... We, he eventually is Jetfire. And at the end of this, um, there is a like some explanations on different things from Simon Furman, like why he chose some things and 
it, it was very informative. So if you if you get the book, make sure you read that. Uh, the art, as we've praised Guido already on the covers, the art is fantastic throughout. Uh, and the colors are great. You have like the purple sound wave to match the G1 series. And the the coloring dots are everywhere. And just very, very retro style. And I just really enjoyed it. I guess before we get into this, we have a um, some comments from Yoshi on the book. So we're, we're going to hear what Yoshi has to say, and then we'll we'll all talk about the book. All right, fellas, let's talk about covers, because there's way too many of them, and I mean that seriously, and a couple of them I feel cheap in this book. Uh, the cover that jumped out at me right away was Cover B, and uh, it jumped out at me to a point where I had no idea at glance who drew it and who colored it, which is weird because usually I can look at this and tell, but I wasn't sure. Scrolled down to the bottom of, the, of our little uh, advanced preview here. It turns out it's Casey Collar and John Paul Beauvais. So that's great. I love those guys and I love that cover. Most of these covers I like, and I am going to try and get all of them. Uh, there's more than the original three that was solicited back before the end times began, and I had my comic book store uh, get them. So I'm going to have to hunt for some of these. Um, I do find, I don't know who drew it. I can't find the information on it. It's an RE cover uh, with Optimus Prime uh, leaning over, holding Megatron in gun mode. This cover, I like and hate it, and I, I guess I like it more because I kind of want to find it. it. It definitely invokes, do you guys remember that old MTV, uh, I don't know if anime is the right word, but that old MTV cartoon, I think it was called Avon Flux. That screams Avon Flux to me, and I guess it's that nostalgia pull where I kind of want that. It's really cool. I don't dig the Soundwave version for the uh, for the other cover. Um, and then uh, we have a couple of covers that were done by John Yang uh, for East Side Comics. The, I, I don't understand this. Like, first of all, John is clearly talented here. I'm not. I'm not dissing his art. I'm dissing the creative choice. This is not a G1 interpretation of Optimus Prime or Megatron. This is not. It, it it cheapens the book. You've now IDW has now made enough covers that like I like hunting for covers. When when Regen One came out, I liked hunting for those covers. At most, I think we got one time five variant covers for one issue, but generally it was three, and they were fun to hunt for. I, I enjoyed that, but this is. This is stupid. This is way too many covers to hunt for, and they've got covers that are so far removed from the source material. It just cheapens the book, I think. I do dig the uh, the RE cover, the convention exclusive. I don't know how or, or when that's going to become available. Uh, I'm going to try and hunt it down. Maybe you guys know a little bit more on the show at the time of recording, but I, I sure as shit wasn't able to find anything. So with the cover talk out of the way, I want to talk about the story because... This was really good, guys. This, this was a really good story. Wasn't a one and done like I, I really love, but man, if I'm not invested and eager for issue two to come out, it was just, this is an example of the quality you can get if IDW gets out of their own way. If, if they just applied this practice to their uh, to their own Transformers, to the ones that they've created, I would be so on board and so enjoying it. You know, but you've you've got Simon Furman writing this, who has lived in this universe through the '80s and '90s. He knows what he's doing. There's no there's no question when he puts his pen to paper, people are going to buy this. It is that good. I'm I'm really. I wish there was a cover with punch on it and then an alternate cover with counter punch on it because those would have been my favorites. This is, it's just, it's such a good story. Holy hell. Especially if you compare it to issue zero. And this is issue zero, I feel like, is an example of IDW in their own way. That was a story, again, written by Simon Furman, but it didn't have enough room to breathe. It was, it was, it, it wasn't enough pages for the whole idea and concept to not feel rushed, which is a shame because it was, 
it, it was a, a prequel to my favorite stories in the Marvel Transformers run. So, uh, you know, it was just, I think visually too, if you looked at the two books together, like as I recall, issue zero, there were more panels per page. They were really cramped. There was way more text on it. And and here we've got a story that's it's not a one and done it's a it's a four and done but the story has room to breathe the panels aren't cramped you're not you're not overloaded with trying to remember everything that happened in the original Marvel stories and apply this prequel knowledge to it this this was a walk in the park for me guys an entertaining walk in the park where I could stop and smell the roses of nostalgia. And there were nods to, to, to things that happened in the Marvel run, little winks to the reader. And I loved that. It wasn't, it wasn't forced on me. It, wasn't, it, it, it just all flowed so well. And I, for the sake of a floundering IDW that's having trouble keeping the lights on, I really hope they pay attention to this. I hope this book sells well. I hope they see what kind of comics can be written and produced that are amazing if they just get out of their own way a little bit. I I really feel that way. Now I want to talk about the art of the book. Uh, Guido Guidi drew uh, the internal pages, uh, beautiful pages. One thing that stuck out at me, probably around page three or four, and then it just started jumping out all over to me, but I felt like Guido was going through those first 10 or 20 issues of Transformers and really took in the angles of those original books, the angles of scenes and the poses characters made because Guido didn't draw like Budiansky, doesn't draw like Budiansky and those first few uh, folks that were on on those original issues, those, those first 20 ish- issues of Transformers. He doesn't draw like that. But I felt like he homaged their art by copying the poses characters did. Not not like a one for one, like Optimus Prime stands like this, but like Punch Counterpunch would stand in a way that was to me reminiscent of poses from those early books. I wonder if you guys felt like that. I'm gonna be really interested in listening to what your thoughts are and uh and whatnot, but I felt like that was the way Guido could could pay homage to to the art style, uh, which was pose copying, because his art style doesn't match, you know, Delbo's or the other folks that worked on there. It's his style, but he can he can match and homage poses, and that man that stuck out to me like a, a very sore thumb. Bove did an excellent job coloring this book. It it, it was colored with the eye of nostalgia. Like the old books didn't look like this, but the further you get away from reading the old Marvel run, the more your mind starts to uh, romanticize what those books looked like. And I feel like that's what Bove brought to this. He brought a romanticized nostalgia to the colors, um, making it look like it was printed on paper, that kind of thing. Like double thumbs up, man. I, I didn't catch... Uh, a whole lot of uh, textures in this, and and by God, because I love G one so much, I consciously or not, I appreciate the fact that a lot of textures weren't used. Let's see what else. I actually started writing notes after about page three because so much stuff was flying through my mind about this, and uh, I didn't want to forget anything. But uh, let me kind of, I have a section in my notes listed as downsides, and I l- let me see what we got here. So. Simon Furman has, as a writer on Transformers, has the benefit of hindsight. He's able to really construct a story because he's fucking lived it for so long. I mean, this guy, you can't have a better person writing a Transformers story, especially a G1 story. And and it shows here. So the problem with hindsight might be that if you write a prequel... I don't think if this was written in the style of those original first four, ten issues, I don't think we would like it. I I mean, I love the original Marvel run, but reading those first ten issues, man, that's 
that's hard to read. I enjoy it. I do it through a nostalgia, but they're not easy to read. Those are those are difficult, especially with you know having to always name the characters on that are being spoken to and stuff. There's a, there were a lot of policies in place there that were kooky, and uh, it's just difficult now. So uh, the way I've interpreted this, and I, I think I've interpreted it correctly, is you've read the original Marvel run. Counterpunch Punch shows up to tell you a story of the before times, the before uh, the arc took off and that kind of thing. And and told that way, then Simon Furman can avoid the lengthy way that the original issues were written, that 80s, uh, that 80s style, if you will. He doesn't have to do that and therefore made a more entertaining book for us. I've never thought of a prequel for G1. So uh, uh, th- it's really interesting and it works. It, I can't see it working any other way. Again, I'm really eager to listen to what you guys have to say when this episode comes out and if you agree with this or not. But I don't know how else you could tell a prequel. I mean, the purists out there are going to be like, eh, eh, this wasn't written in the original way that the any comics were written. Well, no, because who would want to read that? So I argue that this is this is the best way a prequel could have been approached. You guys you guys make fun of me for being such a G1 purist and never being satisfied. You know, issue 1 of Transformers 84, I'm pretty fucking satisfied here. And uh uh I know in uh the last uh Transformers versus Terminator talk, uh, I I took a lot of shit not being able to defend myself, but I took a lot of shit about how much closer do I want the art to look like G1 to be happy with something? Uh, I present to you issue one, gentlemen. Uh, This is is what I'm looking for. This is it. You know, I would love to have Delbo come back and do an issue. That'd be fun as shit. I would love to have Wild Men do issues. That'd be fun as shit. Guido is knocking this out of the park. This these look like Transformers. These look like G1 Transformers. And I love his take on what the Dinobots looked like before their alt modes were were dinosaurs. Kudos to him. I mean I I'm I'm happy with this. I'm I'm so happy with this. I'm not happy with a couple of the covers as I said earlier. Uh they cheapen the book and especially for those of us who have to collect all I'm not collecting those, but for those of us who have to collect every cover like shame on you IDW. Those those should have not made it past Q&A for what this book is supposed to be. You know, for for G1 fans this is a glass of ice water for, for all of us who've been suffering through the IDW Transformers reboot. I, IDW just needs to get out of their own way and let good stories be told and let good art be drawn and let good colors be colored and let good letters be lettered. So yeah, uh, I hate that I can't be on the show with you guys to talk about this. And uh, until I can, take care. I'll talk to you later. Right. Thanks, Yoshi. And I think we'll talk to you about the where to get some of those comics, those covers. But you brought up some good points. Some of the homages that I, I also didn't mention earlier was like where you see like bots transforming. You actually see as if it were the toy transforming or you see like the kind of faded version of their previous mode behind them, much like the Marvel comic did. Charles, you are probably more into the or more familiar with the G1 series than the rest of us outside of Yoshi. What were your thoughts on this? I really liked it. I really enjoyed it. I think, uh, I mean, to, uh, to respond to Yoshi's point about, uh, you know, the nostalgia factor and how it's not exactly like G1. I mean, I think what, what I feel like this book is what, like my kid rose colored glasses, kid eyes would have thought that the G1 art looked like when I was a kid. So, you know, if you go back and look at the G1 comics, the Marvel, the Marvel series, I mean, they're eighties comics. They're not amazing. I mean, the, the, for nostalgia, you know, I love them. I, you know, I, I reread them several times throughout the years. You know, I collected them. I love them, but their art is not, just not good as it is today. And I, but I think what this captures here is the feel and the style of that art, but it's much better. <laughs> uh, 
and I think uh, Yoshi's right that he that Guido captures the poses and the and the I I think the um the placement and like the 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 composition of how characters are laid out in the stories he he captures that 80s feel very well but the art is just much better than what we got in the 80s and i think john paul john paul bove's colors also make it feel like an 80s comic but the but it also is much better <laughs> And, uh, you know, and much uh, and and really, really gives you that nostalgia feel. But uh, but it's it modernizes it. And so I think it's great. I think the art is great. I, I really enjoyed the story, too. I, I'm looking forward to the next three issues. I disagree with what Yoshi said about issue zero from last year. I don't think that book felt cramped at all. And, I and you know, he for all the the times he says he wants self-contained one and done stories, I thought that issue was a great self-contained one and done story. And they actually gave it extra pages that that book had 24 pages where the standard uh, comics now have 20 pages. So I didn't I didn't feel like it was cramped at all. But I think that I, this is this is nice that it's continuing on and refers back to that story from issue zero last year, and I I think it's great. I I really am like to see what where it's going from here. I loved all the Easter eggs, all the references. We have this Decepticon Skyfire, and you see Shockwave taking his brain module, so that that ties into the Marvel series where he created a, a different version of of uh, you know Jetfire on Earth. We have uh, the Dinobots, of course, before they became dinosaurs and starting the rivalry with Shockwave. So uh, I'm sure that's going to be followed up on in the next issue. I, I love Megatron with the black helmet. Uh, that's We only got that in the comics. Everywhere else he had the gray helmet, but Megatron with the black helmet, that, that screams Marvel Comics to me. You know, getting Perceptor also uh, as you know, because Perceptor was also one of the key Transformers that was left behind on Cybertron in the Marvel comics. So it's nice to give him a little uh, a little bit of a backstory too. I, I, I yeah, I was really happy with this. Cool. Yeah, and like I said, it's kind of putting things into place, making sure certain characters didn't make it onto the Nemesis that didn't show up in the Marvel book. All right, uh, Epic. I'm not sure how familiar you were with the Marvel series. I'm, I'm guessing probably not very. Not at all. <laughs> yeah. So I. So well, yeah, with that perspective, what did you think of this book? I mean, uh, I'm sure this is a very unpopular opinion, but I don't actually care for the art style like this, like the G1 art style and stuff. I like the more modern things, but I get like that's not what the point of this is and stuff. So for what it is, for that it's supposed to be like the G1 art style and all that, I thought it was really cool. Uh, when you look at it that way and everything. Uh, I really like the story. I did read the issue zero first, and uh, honestly, I actually like kind of had a hard time following it, so I had to like look up to fully understand what was happening. But once I did, once I like grasped what the story was and where we were going, and I don't know if that's because like since I'm not really familiar with the Marvel comics at all, I don't know if, I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but once I did, I like, fully this uh, issue one really enjoyed the story and got what it was doing and all this stuff. And yeah, I, I love all like the Skyfire nod and everything. Uh, and yeah, no, it was really cool. I really liked this one. Uh, Daryl, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, I thought it was a really fun ride. Um, I too really appreciated the, uh, uh, the transformation scene with um, <clears throat> I'm trying to see who it might have been one of the uh, the cone heads. But uh, yeah, you see them basically uh, like mid transformation with their head kind of on that swivel. And it's uh, it's just it's just awesome. Would have been dirge because the other two you can see in the background. So, yeah, it's just they look it looks great. I really liked the uh, the designs of the Dinobots in their Cybertronian modes, the tanks for uh for slag and uh snarl and sludge just having these like really badass looking tanks that uh, you can totally see the dinobots like their alt modes the dinosaurs in there but they're not exactly there they're just kind of you know rough and tumble tanks it's better than the war with own design yeah and i thought they were great so these are fun i just i really like the art it was fun it was an action-packed little uh, comic there 
I enjoyed I enjoyed some of the callbacks as well. I'm looking definitely looking forward to uh, to the next uh, the next issue. I, I'm I'm actually kind of excited to 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 hear like Yoshi uh, try and convince Epic how this is good. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never be convinced. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's a, it's a good it's a good story. Um, I thought it was a fun ride, and uh, I'm I'm pretty uh, pretty pumped on the art as well. Guido does a really good job of capturing that uh, that old eighty style with a little modern flair. All right, so yeah, I can't wait to get to the next issue, and hopefully they will have had time during, I guess, the break of to put a lot a lot more work into polishing these up. But this this was just fantastic, I think. So that is our comic review, and that was Transformers eighty four Secrets and Lies number one. So let's move on to Transformers Media News. All right, in Media News this week, not a whole heck of a lot to talk about, but we got some more uh, promotional images for Netflix's show. The, uh, I believe this is likely the last image we're going to get, and it's, uh, it's a pretty big image uh, showing a, a lot of characters and uh, the AllSpark in the front, so... That looks pretty awesome. Yeah, it's uh, it looks looks like a lot of uh, I don't know. It looks looks like a desktop wallpaper. If you wanted a desktop wallpaper for this thing, yeah, this is it. So yeah, it's pretty big. Kind of want I I want to look at this thing and like kind of dissect it and see if there's any hints in here. But I really I really can't see anything. It's essentially the promotional like the promotional images that all the websites put out mm-hmm. last week. This is is essentially one of those, or like combined. Yeah, this is awesome. Netflix has just like made the page live for the actual series. Right. Also, with regards to the Netflix uh, series, we got the final trailer, and uh, that is uh, uh, something that you can watch here. We got links to it in the show notes. Um, it's cool. It's pretty dark, and I, I mean, I'm sure we've all watched the trailer, but I got to give it to. The guy who's voicing Megatron, I cannot remember his name. I know he was in the Machinima series as well, but man, Jason Marnosha. Marnosha, yeah, yeah. So th- this is a this is dark, man. Like it's it doesn't even sound like the same Megatron. Like I know he got nicknamed Sassy Megatron in the uh, in the uh, Machinima series, but it doesn't even sound like the same guy. So he's doing a really good job here. And uh, it's uh, it's a pretty cool a pretty cool trailer, yeah. I'm uh, I'm pretty stoked about this series. Take a look at that trailer if you haven't already seen it. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty pretty badass. And lastly, we've got uh, episode 16 of Cyberverse is going to hit uh, YouTube on Monday, as per already, usual. Already hit. Well, there you go. Has already hit. <laughs> time, time is a. <laughs> Weird mistress. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there you go. All right, well, uh, let's finish up the show with convention news. All right, uh, we have lots of San Diego Comic Con, or now Comic Con at home news. This um, will be July 24th. Uh, the whole thing will be uh, July 22nd through 26th. And we have a number of panels here that are uh, in the Transformers sphere. Uh, the first one here is the Science of Back to the Future. And this is, yes, it's all about tran- uh, Back to the Future, but also it, they're going to talk about the Transformers uh, crossover. Uh, this is um, got John Barber, editor-in-chief of IDW, also writer of Back to the Future and Transformers. Uh, Kevin Scott, who is a uh, writer on Back to the Future. Uh, Juan Samu, who is artist uh, on it says Transformers and many other pop culture classics. Uh, Sara Nadiri, uh, who is outreach director at the... Uh, I, you got I cannot this. pronounce his name. <laughs> <laughs> Ali Kyoglu, Data Science Institute at UC San Diego. Nailed it. Uh, engineer and robot builder. <laughs> uh, Dr. Lisa Will... Fleet Science Center resident astronomer and professor of physics and astronomy at San Diego City College. 
and Andrea Decker, Fleet Science Center moderator, uh, she, panel moderator, I guess. They're going to be actually talking about, I guess, the science and stuff revolving around uh, Back to the Future, obviously, but then also the comic series and stuff. So I think this will be a lot of fun. This will be July 23rd from 3 to 4 p.m. Now, all of these are going to be on YouTube, so you'll be able to watch them uh, after the fact. But uh, if you go to Comic-Con or comic-con.org, you'll get the full schedules. Uh, the next one, and this one we have heard from deep sources that you should watch this one. Um, this is the Rooster Teeth panel. Uh, among other things they're going to have, there's no description here, but among other t- things they're going to talk about is obviously the War for Cybertron series. So, like I said, we have heard you should watch this one. This is Saturday, July 25th from 1 to 2 p.m. And let this wet your whistle, whistle for our interview with F.J. DeSanto. So, big lead into the Netflix series uh, is happening. So, Saturday, July 25th from 2 to 3 p.m. So, immediately following this one, uh, IDW in 2020 and beyond. This is hosted by uh, Chris Rial and John Barber and are moderated by uh, George Jean Gustinis, who is a senior editor in, at the New York Times. Uh, and this is uh, basically just a behind the scenes look at IDW and looking at what's ahead. And since there are apparently a lot of Transformer books on the decks right now between the main series, Galaxies, uh, the Terminator book, Transformers 84, and the My Little Pony crossover, and Back to the Future crossover. So we we were kind of in a drought for a while, and now there's a ton of books. So hopefully they'll have some information there. Uh, we have Imagination and Fun for Kids, the IDW way. This is moderated by author Sam Maggs. and has Evan Stanley, who's on their Sonic book, Tony Fleeks, who's uh, doing My Little Pony and Star Wars Adventures, graphic novel uh, creator Kim Dillinol. I'm sorry about that. Uh, she does Surfside Girls, uh, Jared Cullum, who does Coley, and Adam Tierney, who does Afraid of Everything. And this is intended to show kids how to unlock their creative potential. So not necessarily Transformers, but IDW-related. Uh, might be a fun panel if you have kids that are interested in artistic stuff. And finally, Saturday or sorry, Sunday, July 26th, from 3, 3 to 4 p.m., The Writer's Journey, Developing a Producer's Mentality. Uh, this is... Um, Looks, it's about uh, screenwriting and just, I guess, if you want to be in the entertainment industry, uh, this has a number of people that have made it made their way in. Among them, Brandon Easton, who has, we've interviewed on the show before. Uh, he's done some stuff for the comics, and he's a writer on the War for Cybertron Siege series. And he's moderating the panel, and on the panel are Jeffrey Thorne, who is producer on Black Panther's Quest, Brandon Thomas, writer on Excellence. Ramon Govia, who is a writer on Starseed Memoirs. And Shannon Eric Denton, who is a writer on Spider-Man. Um, this will be another interesting one. I'm not sure how many uh, Transformer nuggets we're going to get from it, but uh, Brandon's a good guy, so I'm sure he'll, he'll, he'll probably uh, drop something. Yeah, so this will probably be an interesting panel. That is it. Uh, It'll be interesting to see so many like traditional San Diego panels uh, since they're going to be all available for everyone. So um, if, if there is anything newsworthy, we'll be talking about it next week. All right. Uh, and that will do it for this episode of Transmissions Alt Mode. Uh, Epic, tell everyone where they can find you on the Internet and find your stuff. You can head on over to epicsuicide.com. That's E-P-Y-K suicide.com. And there you will find all my social media links. All right. And we will see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Later. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening to this episode of Transmissions. But just because this episode is over doesn't mean the Transformers fun has to stop. Join us and other Transformers fans on our Discord chat server by visiting transmissionspodcast.com slash Discord. If you would like to learn more about how you could support the Transmissions Podcast, just visit transmissionspodcast.com slash support. Thank you all for listening, and we'll see you again next week.
Did we just find a new <gasps> a new clock? I think we did. <laughs> we did. That, <laughs> it's such a better. garbage site, though. It's so bad. <laughs> <laughs> I know. The U.S. government can't do anything right. God. What a garbage site. Speaking about clocks, this... Oh, that's a shitty thing. But if the image comes up, this image of, that you see all the mm-hmm. time of clocks drives me nuts, this type of clock. <laughs> <laughs> Why? You don't like analog Did you not clocks? learn how to read analog? Oh, I did. <laughs> but there is no numero, Roman numeral four. Oh, yeah. That's, oh. that's terrible. <laughs> oh. Okay. It drives me absolutely bonkers because it's so common. You see it everywhere. And once you see it, because I've just ruined it's, it for you, you'll never no, unsee it. I can't unsee it. Oh, and you'll be like, you. It's probably, though, to avoid confusion with the seven and the no, six. No, it was done for... Mm-hmm. It's ridiculous. <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> Rocky two plus Rocky five <laughs> equals Rocky seven. Adrian's revenge. Adrian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've also been until today. I was out of cokes for like two or three days, so I was like not nearly as caffeinated as normal. You couldn't get your dealer to show up. <laughs> <laughs> It means you have to, you know, mask up and go to the store and 